will go to the next chapter, uh, chapter four. Oh, no, Bayan, the Bogana day. Yes, that is the advantage if you're in the Philippines. Voice activated. Pag bang ring ang telephone, die, answer the phone. Pag nandun ka sa labas, when the phone rings, talagang tatakbo ka. Yung landline, eh wala naman silang landline doon. Puro, puro ano na, cellphone. Pero ganun ba? Kasi pag may wifi ka, di ba, may package yun, may, may landline. Oh, yan ang advantage. If you're in the Philippines, die. Uha ka ng tubig kasi iinom ako. But if you are outside, uh, you really have to go to the ref to get water. Uh, you remember this? Extracellular, you're supposed to memorize this, right? Diba? Extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Nag breakfast ka ba, Tyrone? Hmm? Parang hindi. Kasi ang aga-aga mong naantok. So, your extracellular fluid has more sodium than the inside, right? So we'll have a review on this. Sodium in the extra sodium has more, I mean extracellular fluid has more sodium, calcium, chloride, bicarbonates, glucose, what else? Oxygen. Okay. And the pH is 7.4. Whereas in the intracellular fluid, we have more potassium, magnesium, phosphates, Amino acids, cholesterol, phospholipids, and neutral fats. Okay. And more carbon dioxide. Why? Why is there more amino acids? Because the amino acids will be used to synthesize energy and manufacture proteins. And so more amino acids inside the cells and more more glucose outside than inside, but more fat, no? cholesterol, phospholipids, and neutral fat. And you notice that, what did we say regarding carbon dioxide? Because you have more carbon dioxide inside, 
because carbon dioxide is a product of metabolism. And when this is brought outside the cell, this will be diluted by the extracellular fluid. So by the time it reaches the, ex the extracellular fluid, it will become, it will be 46 millimeters mercury only because Yeah, CO2 is the product of metabolism. And so from the cell, it will go to the extracellular fluid, then it will go to the blood and find its way back into, find its way into the lungs where it is being brought outside through the respiration. And your oxygen, you know, is outside in the extracellular fluid. It is only 35, it is 35 millimeters mercury, but inside the cell, it is 20 millimeters of mercury only lower. Okay, why? Because most of the oxygen is already utilized by the intracellular fluid. Okay. Cholesterol, phospholipids, neutral fat. Because you also need this, just like amino acids. You need this for energy production and also glucose. From 90, it will become 20 because most of that is utilized for energy production. The begin. So, Take note of this. Sodium is 142 milliequivalents per liter in the extracellular fluid, and potassium is 140 millimeters equivalent per liter. And that's your cell wall, okay? How do you transport substances through the cell membrane? Your cell membrane is Lipid bilayer, right? Lipid bilayer. So lipid soluble substances can easily pass through through simple diffusion. Some who are not that are not lipid soluble, they pass through the protein channels. But the oxygen and carbon dioxide are very soluble in lipids. So they just pass through the cell wall with ease, very easily. That's why you cannot feel the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs because it is automatic. So diffusion and active 
transport. Diffusion can be simple diffusion or facilitated. By facilitated diffusion, it will make use of carrier proteins, but it doesn't utilize energy. Whereas active transport, it also utilizes carrier proteins, but it uses energy. So modes of transport of substances through the cell membrane is through simple diffusion, carrier mediated transport, osmosis, endocytosis, and exocytosis. Simple diffusion, now carrier mediated transport is either facilitated diffusion or active transport. Carrier mediated transport is still diffusion, but they use protein transport mechanism. The active transport could, could, could either be primary or secondary active transport. The secondary could either be co-transport or counter-transport. When you say diffusion, simple diffusion, it is the movement of molecules from one area to another by random thermal motion. So it is from one area of higher concentration to the towards the area of lesser molecule concentration until an equilibrium is reached. So there is a net flux between two compartments, always from higher to lower concentration along a concentration gradient. The diffusion equilibrium is reached when the concentrations of the substances in the two compartments are already equal. The magnitude of the net flux across a membrane is directly proportional to the concentration difference across the membrane. It is affected, it is directly proportional to the concentration difference to the surface area of the membrane and the membrane permeability coefficient. Surface area. Of course, if the surface area is large, then more diffusion will take place, okay? And the membrane permeability coefficient, how permeable is the substance that will undergo diffusion will depend on how fast is the magnitude of the diffusion. So the net flux will depend on the surface area times the permeability coefficient times the difference of the concentration of the substance from the outside and the in inside, intracellular and extracellular. The diffusion coefficient takes into account 
the thermal energy, the size of the molecules, and the viscosity of the medium through which the diffusion is taking place. Of course, if it is higher temperature, then the diffusion is faster. If more bigger molecules, then the diffusion is faster. If, how about the viscosity? If more viscous, lesser, okay? Just like uh, if it is more gelatinous and uh, this one, the other one is more fluid, then you will have lesser if it is more viscous. Permeability coefficient incorporates diffusion coefficient, distance along which the diffusion is occurring and the area across which the diffusion is occurring. The permeability coefficient has units of velocity, example centimeters per second, and concentration gradient has the unit mole per square per uh, square, uh, is that square? Uh, what, how do you call it? Centimeters cube. Cube, cube. <laughs> yes, that's, you mole per cubic centimeter. Thus, flux is the unit of flux is mole per square centimeters per second. So, in the transport of substances through the cell membrane, different factors affect the net rate of diffusion, simple diffusion. So, the net flux is proportional to the difference of the concentration from the outside and the inside, inside the cell. And the net flux is proportional to the electrical force electrical force, the, you know, the negative and the positive. If the inside is negative with relative to the outside, the flow is not, is not much because there is repulsion. But if it is opposite, it is positive and negative, then the flow will be faster. For example, the inside is positive and the outside is negative. So molecules will flow towards the inside because this is attracted to the positive. And net flux is proportional to the pressure difference. If there is more pressure for example, in two compartments, two compartments, P1 and P2, you apply a, a pressure on P1, so the pressure will be higher on P1, and so more molecules will flow towards P2, okay? And vice versa, if you apply pressure from to P2, more molecules will move towards P1. It is dependent on the pressure difference. And the surface area for diffusion. If more, if the surface area is higher, more surface area, then the net flux would be faster. Just like in your alveolar area, in the lungs, you know, in the alveolus, let me 
me see. Oh. For example, you, you already are familiar with your lungs, right? That in the alveolar area, it is being It is, uh, what do you call this? It is not straight line. It is being corrugated, right? From the trachea to the bronchi, to the smaller bronchioles, and then to the alveolar area. That nature has purposely designed to make that into uh, this is not a straight smooth, it has to have curves, you know, so that the surface area will be bigger and so that the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is, has bigger area, surface area, so more oxygen and carbon dioxide will exchange more oxygen going to the tissues and more carbon dioxide will be expelled outside from the tissues. And then the lipid solubility. Net flux is proportional to the lipid solubility. Remember, this is bilipid layer. And some substances are lipid soluble and others are not lipid soluble. The oxygen and carbon dioxide, they are very lipid soluble. So they just pass through the membranes easily. Yeah? Excuse me for a minute. We'll have a break of two minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Where were we? Surface area, lipid soluble. The oxygen is very lipid soluble. That's why. Oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily pass through the membrane. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, alcohol, steroids can easily pass through the lipid bilayer. That's why steroids, once you inject them, they very they, their action is fast because they can easily pass through the lipid bilayer. Diffusion of water and other lipid insoluble molecules, example, your sodium, potassium, urea, glucose, is through protein channels. And then Oh, sorry. The voltage gating, the molecular conformation of the The gate corresponds responds to the electrical potential across the cell membrane. For example, outside this is, can you see the arrow? So this yes, is stop. sodium. Thank you. This is sodium. But the gate is closed. So the sodium can you remember sodium is more, there is more sodium outside the cell, right? Extracellular. And inside, only few sodium, more potassium. And there are only also few potassium outside. If the gate is closed, sodium cannot get inside the cell. And once it is open, the sodium will get inside. And the charge of the protein channel is negative. So sodium will go inside. And then once inside, the gate can close. Okay, and potassium also, if this is closed, potassium cannot go out. And once the gate inside is open, so potassium will go out. Some will open through binding of a chemical substance with the protein. So causing a conformational change in the protein molecule. So it opens or closes depending on the binding, on the chemical that will bind to the transport protein. So simple diffusion, ano ba yan? Wrong spelling. You know, sometimes you do that. Why? Because the, the students will react of what's going on. Simple diffusion, carrier-mediated transport. 
facilitated diffusion and active transport. Carrier mediated transport involves binding the transported solute to a carrier protein in the membrane. The carrier protein undergoes a conformational change to transport a substance across, just like this. From the outside, this is the extracellular fluid. So they will bind inside that. There are binding sites of the carrier protein. And so they will bind and this will be transported. Once it reaches the other side, the carrier protein will open. See, so the transported solute will be released towards the inside. This is the carrier mediated transport. In the facilitated diffusion, no energy is involved in carrier and facilitated diffusion. But in active transport, energy is already involved. So characteristics of a mediated transport. One is stereo specificity, just like a key and lock, very specific. For example, also the D-glucose, the natural isomer of glucose is transported by facilitated diffusion, but the L-isomer is not. Another characteristic of carrier mediated transport is it reaches a saturation point. The transport race rate increases as the concentration of the solute increases until the carriers are saturated. The transport maximum is analogous to the maximum velocity in the enzyme kinetics. This will be discussed this afternoon in biochemistry, your enzyme kinetics. So better don't miss the, the lecture of Dr. Monsanto because he doesn't care if you are there or not and you are at a loss because you are, this is already graduate school. Competition, there is competition in carrier mediated transport. They compete for transport sites on the carrier protein, especially if they are structurally related. For example, galactose is a competitive inhibitor of glucose transport in the small intestine. So food with plenty of galactose, it will compete for glucose. Okay, so stereospecific reaches a saturation point, just like here. The rate of diffusion will reach a saturation point. If there is the facilitated simple diffusion, no saturation point. Why? Because of the carrier carrier proteins, the binding site can be saturated. If it's already filled up, you don't have a place anymore. So there, you don't have a site, so you cannot enter, okay? You don't have a site to attach, so you cannot enter. Facilitated diffusion, carrier mediated. Movement is from higher to lower concentration across the membrane until equilibrium is reached. Remember, no metabolic energy is required for this process. The 
excuse me, is If you would like to go out of the lecture room, no need to leave because I will keep on admitting students here. No? Mahuman na lang, mahuman na lang ang lecture. Then I will still be admitting students. Okay? And then it will interfere in my lecture and in my slides. So, please be considerate enough. Do not keep on moving. If you would like to go up, then go up. Do not, do not, uh, no need to leave or exit, you know, because I have to keep on manipulating here. Admit, admit, admit a, a few minutes ago, this student had been admitted already in the room. And then now, back. Ang kwan ba ka ng samok? It's so... Yan na. We'll continue. For example, high glucose. Ah, tapos na to eh. No metabolic energy is required for the process of facilitated diffusion. In active transport, it is still carrier mediated. But it transports a substance across the membrane from an area with lower concentration to an area with higher concentration against an electrochemical gradient, or it is transporting uphill, okay? Requires, thus, requires metabolic energy. High potassium. Two types of active transport, primary active transport or secondary active transport. In primary active transport, the energy derived, it, the energy is derived directly from the breakdown of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, or of some other high energy phosphate compound. The secondary active transport, the energy is derived secondarily from the energy that has been stored in the form of ionic concentration differences of secondary molecular or ionic substances between the two sides of a cell membrane created originally by primary active transport. Just like your glucose, you know, in the intestine, glucose is from the digested food, right? And then in, from the lumen of the intestine, glucose has to go inside the cell. But glucose cannot get inside the cell without a co-transport. This time it is sodium. Ay, secondary active transport na pala yan. The primary active transport is sodium and potassium. Using ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So the sodium from the tubular cells will be brought to the interstitial fluid. 
in exchange for potassium. Inside the cell, you have plenty of potassium and it has, uh, yeah. Whereas glucose, glucose has to accompany with sodium. Along with glucose is sodium. That's why, you know, Filipinos, sabi nila, why am I diabetic? Hindi naman ako fond of, I'm not fond of sweets. But you are fond of my TV kayo? But you're fond of bulad. Diba? It has plenty of sodium. Yeah. And so along with glucose is sodium. Partner talaga yan sila. So, hypertensive and high blood sugar. Okay? The, so the glucose from the tubular cells, it will travel through by facilitated diffusion in the interstitial fluid. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I forgot. I thought that. I thought that's the end of Lecture room. This is secondary active transport. The glucose has to ride the sodium. Hmm? The energy of absorb of the energy of the energy used to absorb glucose will rely on the energy from the sodium. Okay, so this is secondary active transport, just like the amino acids. But when it reaches the tubular cells going to the interstitial extracellular fluid, going to the, you know, going to the cells from the cells of the intestine, it will only facilitate utilize facilitated diffusion no more sodium ano ba yan hana rose moslaris sha excuse me sha are you there could you please admit the students? I admit ka na, Doc. Yeah. Ang, ang mag-flash kasi siya sa screen ko eh. Interfere sa uh, the slides. I already admitted. Siguro, Doc, sa net po yan kasi nawawala and then babalik eh. Kompleto na kasi. 
yung yung attendance. Sige. Also hydrogen. That is secondary active transport, but this time it is counter transport. The hydrogen, the absorption of sodium in exchange for hydrogen. Hydrogen will be secreted out to the tubular lumen. Okay. Types of secondary active transport. Downhill flow of an ion is linked to the uphill movement of a second solute. If the uphill movement of the second solute is in the same direction as the ion, it is called core transport. If in the opposite direction, it is counter transport. So glucose and sodium, they are called transport secondary active transport but sodium and hydrogen is counter transport okay review sodium extracellular fluid is 140 while in the intercellular fluid here it is 150 but there is a range to that as i said earlier during the previous lecture there is no definite normal no? for example your sodium there it is not only the value of normal is 140 in the because uh, homeostasis will vary, you know, it differs, the homeostasis, because we are a living being, okay? So we vary and potassium more on the intracellular, more calcium, in the extracellular, more sodium, calcium, chlorides, bicarbonates, glucose. But the osmolarity is of the cell is 300 milliosmol per liter. This is the normal inside the cell. The concept of concentration. Solutes dissolve in a solvent, mainly water forms a solution. The solute concentration is the amount of the solute present in a unit volume of solution, usually water. The unit of volume in the metric system is liter. One way of expressing concentration is as mole per liter. One mole of a compound is the amount of a compound in grams equal to its molecular weight. A solution The molecular weight of a molecule is equal to the sum of the atomic weights of the atoms in the molecule. For example, glucose. The formula of glucose is C6H12O6. So it has a molecular weight of 180. How is it derived? Glucose has six carbon, right? Six. In, in glucose, you have six carbon, but the atomic weight of carbon is 12. So six times 12 plus, okay. 
the atomic weight of hydrogen is one. Remember, in the atomic, uh, in the table, when you had your chemistry, hydrogen is number one there in the atomic uh, table. Diba? Table of elements. So the atomic weight of hydrogen is one. Glucose has 12 hydrogen, so 12 times one. Plus oxygen, glucose has six oxygen. The atomic weight of oxygen is 16. So plus, uh, yeah, six times 16. So it 180. There is no unit yet. Water is H2O. So two hydrogen, two times one plus one oxygen, one times 16 has a molecular weight of 18. Sodium chloride, one sodium with an atomic weight of 23 plus one chloride with an atomic weight of 35, so it is 58, okay? Calcium chloride, one calcium, atomic weight of calcium is 40, plus two calcium times 35 atomic weight. So calcium chloride is 110. If the molecular weight is expressed in grams, it is now called a mole. So abbreviated as MOL, mole. So 180 grams of glucose equals one mole of glucose. 18 grams of Water is one mole of water. 58 grams of sodium chloride equals one mole of sodium chloride. 110 grams of calcium chloride is one mole of calcium chloride. Okay. A solution containing 180 grams of glucose, one mole in one liter of solution is one molar solution of glucose. A solution containing 58 grams of sodium chloride in one liter of solution is one mole solution of sodium chloride. One mole of any molecule will contain the same number of molecules. Thus, a one mole per liter solution of glucose contains the same number of sol solute molecules per liter as a one mole per liter solution of any other substance. For example, it is the same with one mole per liter of sodium chloride or one mole per liter solution of urea. A solution containing 180 grams of glucose, I am again. One hundred eighty grams of glucose in one liter of solution is one molar solution of glucose, one mole per liter. If it is only ninety grams of glucose were dissolved in one liter of solution of water, the solution would have a concentration of 0.5 mole per liter because one mole of glucose is 180 grams. If you place only 90, that's only one half, right? So the result is only 0.5 moles per liter. Concentrations of solutes in the body fluids 
are much less than one mole per liter. So you will encounter in the laboratory concentrations expressed in millimole per liter. One millimole per liter equals 0 0.001 per liter, like that. By convention, the liter is dropped when referring to concentrations. Thus, a one millimole per liter solution is written as one small m and big M. The capital M stands for molar and is defined as small per liter. How about osmosis? Osmolarity and osmotic pressure. Osmosis is the net diffusion of water from an area of higher water concentration to an area of lower water concentration across a membrane. This time, it is water. For osmosis to take place, there must be first a concentration difference in water across a membrane. How can one lower the concentration of water? by adding solute to it. Thus, one liter of sodium chloride solution has lower water concentration than a one liter of pure water. So this is pure water, high water concentration. So how will you lower the concentration of water? By adding solute to it, okay? So now the solution has lower water concentration. The solute molecules occupy the space formerly occupied by the water, right? So the greater the solute concentration, the lower the water concentration will become. Knowing that the solutes in solution are responsible for the decrease in water concentration, we can now define osmosis in terms solute concentration. The flow of water across a semi-permeable membrane from a compartment in which the solute concentration is lower to a compartment in which the solute concentration is higher. That is your osmosis. So, and the first compartment, the solute is two osmos. And in the second compartment, the solute is four osmos. The water is 53.5 meters molar. 51.5 in the second. The volume is one liter, which is more concentrated, which has more water, the one with lesser solute molecules. The more you have solute molecules, the lesser the water molecules will become. One more important, important thing to recognize, it is not the size, the shape, nor the charge that determines the concentration of a solution. It is the number of particles per unit volume of fluid, the number of particles present inside. For example, one mole of glucose in one liter of solution has the same concentration as one mole of amino acid or of urea or any other molecule that exists a single particle in solution. But molecules that ionize in solution or, you know, in, they melt, you know, so they break up into their components. 
they increase their numbers and thus increase the concentration of the solution more than those that do not ionize. Just like your sodium chloride, in one liter of solution dissociates into one mole of sodium and one mole of chloride, producing two moles of solute particles. The effect is doubling of the concentration of the solution. Whereas glucose is only glucose. When you melt glucose, only one particle is produced, so lesser concentration than sodium chloride. One mole of magnesium chloride, when completely ionized, produces one mole of magnesium and two moles of chloride. That's MgCl2, okay? Cl2, so two chlorides, one magnesium, which adds up to three moles of solute particles. The effect is it they will be more concentrated, triple of the concentration of the solution. So it is now obvious that one mole of glucose solution is less concentrated than one mole of sodium chloride solution. Okay. Because the water concentration in a solution depends on the number of solute particles, it is useful to have a concentration term that refers to the total concentration of solute particles in a solution, regardless of their chemical composition. So the total solute concentration of a solution is known as its osmolarity. So one osmol is equal to one mole of solute particle. Thus, a one mole solution of glucose has a concentration of one osmol per liter, whereas a one molar solution of sodium chloride contains two osmol of solute per liter of solution after it ionizes, okay, because it melts, it breaks up the sodium and the chloride. So a liter of solution containing one mole of glucose and one mole of sodium chloride has an osmolarity of three osmoles. Okay, because glucose is only one. One particle, right? And sodium chloride has two particles. So in one molar of glucose, one molar solution of glucose, you only have one and two particles of sodium chloride plus two particles. So you will have three. So in one liter of glucose and sodium chloride, you have three osmoles. You have three particles. A solution with an osmolarity of three osmoles may contain one mole of glucose and one mole of sodium chloride. So three, three osmoles. One mole of three moles of glucose. Three, a 1.5 mole of sodium chloride. One mole of glucose and two mole of urea. Urea, because urea is only one. One mole of calcium chloride. Two chlorides, one calcium, okay? So osmolarity can be calculated using the following equation. Osmolarity equals G times C. What is G? The number of particles in the solution times concentration. Osmolarity is the concentration of the particles, osmoles per liter. G equals the number of particles in the solution. Example, number of particles of your sodium chloride equals two. Number of particles of glucose equals one. Concentration in moles per liter. What is the osmolarity of a one molar sodium chloride solution? Osmolarity 
osmolarity. G times C. Okay, number of particles times concentration. Two osmoles per mole times one molar. Because one mole, one mole sodium chloride. Osmolarity of sodium chloride. How many particles has sodium chloride? Two. Okay, sodium and chloride times one mole sodium chloride solution. Liter, one liter. So two osmoles per liter. Okay. Osmosis across a membrane that is permeable to water but impermeable to solute will lead to an increase in the volume of the compartment on the side that initially had the higher osmolarity and a decrease in the volume of the side that initially had the lower osmolarity. Like this, two solutions are separated by a membrane that is permeable to both water and solute. So, penetrating solute. Solute here and in chamber compartment one is two osmoles, whereas in compartment two, four osmoles. Okay, the water in compartment one is 53.5 and 51 here. And the volume is one liter molar. So this is the initial. And this is penetrating. That means it can pass through. Okay, it can pass through the membrane. So what happens after a while? The solute will become free osmoles because it is penetrating. And the water will become 52.5. The volume still will remain one liter. So they are already in equilibrium. Okay. That is if permeable to both water and solute. So what? That is penetrating solute. Here, when the two solutions separated by a semi-permeable membrane that allows water to pass through, but not the solute, this is non-penetrating solute. Non-penetrating solute. The solute here in compartment one is two osmoles while in compartment two, four of smalls. And the water is 53, 51 here, but the total volume is one liter. That is the initial. But the solute this time cannot pass through the semi-permeable membrane. And so the water can pass, but the solute cannot. non-penetrating solute. So what will pass? The water will equalize so that the solute of both chambers will become equal. They'll become three or small each. But you notice that the volume of chamber two is higher than that of chamber one. Okay, so it will become 1.33 liters already. That is two, so that the solute will be 
equal. We'll reach equilibrium. So the volume of water will differ, okay? Now remember the inside the cell, for example, this is red blood cell. The normal cell volume and the, the normal okay, is inside the cell is 300 milli of small non-penetrating solutes. If it is hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic, when you say hypertonic, 400 milli of smalls, non-penetrating. So, is this uh, hypertonic? This is hypertonic, right? So outside the cell is hypertonic because 400 milli of smalls. While in non-penetrating solutes, 300 milli of smalls inside the cell, right? Non-penetrating solutes. So it cannot get, get in. So isotonic, it will not alter cell. Whereas in your hypotonic solution, what happens? Inside is 300 milli or small. This is the normal. But outside the cell, the water, the solution outside is 200 milli or small and non-penetrating. So hypotonic. So what will happen to the water? it will get inside the cell. Whereas here in your hypertonic, this water from inside the cell will become, will go outside. So what happens to the hypotonic? Hypotonic, the, the cell will burst. With your isotonic, there is no difference. Where it, in your hypertonic, what happens? To renate, huh? Because the water from the inside will go out. Because hypertonic. Isotonic, a solution that does not cause a change in cell volume. One that contains 300 milli or small per liter of non-penetrating solutes, regardless of the concentration of membrane penetrating solutes present. Hypertonic, a solution that causes cells to shrink. One that contains greater than 300 milli or small per liter of non-penetrating solutes, regardless of the concentration of the membrane penetrating solutes present. Hypotonic, a solution that causes cells to swell because it, the solution contains less than 300 milli or small per liter of non-penetrating solutes, but it is the water that will move Okay. Tony Sibis. Just is this the same with referring to osmolarity? When you say isoosmotic, the same 300 milliosmoles inside 
regardless of its composition of membrane penetrating and non-penetrating solutes, they are the same. Meliosmols outside and inside the cell. When you say hyperosmotic, a solution containing greater than 300 meliosmols per liter of solutes, regardless of its composition of membrane penetrating and non-penetrating solutes. So, hyperosmotic, and then hypoosmotic. The a solution containing less than 300 milliosmoles per liter of solutes, regardless of its composition of membrane. So the same, the effect is bursting of the cell. This one is crenation. And this one, no change. Okay. You do this. You try to you try to solve this. I will give you how many minutes. You think you can do? You can do it in. Fifteen minutes. My time here is ten twenty five. You try to calculate. Wala na mawala sa inyo. If you get wrong. It doesn't really matter. But just, you know, the attitude matters. You have to be enthusiastic. The attitude matters. When you, when you are told to solve it, then you try. Kaysa hindi talaga mag-try. If you don't try, that is a negative attitude. If you try, that is positive. Do not be ashamed if mamali. So what? Mamali ka? Hindi. If you get wrong, then the more that you will remember it. The next time, you will not get wrong anymore. Oh, diba? You have until 
there, there is the answer.
Are you done? Then forty. Dan Yes, dan na kayo ano. This is the this is the answer. You're done. Well, bucket kay tumawa. Huh? Done. Done na kayo. You're done already. Your thumbs up. If you're done. Dali lang ito, oi.